Hey, welcome to another episode of Footnotes. Today we're sitting down with Duke Hartman, who's the co-founder and CEO of Integer Technologies here in Columbia. We talk about a lot of things, about how the business started, about where he came from, by the way, that was Hawaii, why he chose to locate here in Columbia, and a little bit about what they're doing. This firm may be doing some of the most important work you've never heard of here, and I think it's a really great story. All this is next on Footnotes. Well, uh, we're here today with uh, Duke Hartman, who's the co-founder and CEO of Integer Technologies, actually here in Columbia, South Carolina. Um, thanks for sitting down with us today and uh, doing an episode of Footnotes. Absolutely. Thanks, Jeff. Um, you know, we were talking, you know, beforehand, and we had the conversation before before we, you know, had this conversation. But, you know, I guess let's start at the beginning. You know, where where did Integer come from? You know, what were you maybe doing a little bit before that? And then and then how in the world did you land? here in Columbia. Yeah, well, it's sort of an interesting story. So I'll take a little bit of time with the origin story because it's sure. uh, it's exciting. Um, so I was a Hawaii guy, born and raised out there, grew up surfing, loving the ocean. Um, also grew up with a scientific family, so I always loved science and engineering. I, think I thought I wanted to be a mad scientist when I grew up. Um, but went to get my mechanical engineering degree and was about to leave the island, um, go work for a big defense contractor, um, but found my dream job working on a pier, the surf break right off off the coast, working on ocean engineering problems. So underwater vehicles, subsea cables, ocean energy related stuff. So definitely a dream job for a kid who loves the ocean and loves engineering. Um, worked there for about nine years and then got recruited to a company that was expanding fast. Um, uh, it's the tip of the spear for the U.S. military out in Hawaii, right? So a um, lot of Navy presence, Department of Defense presence. So this company did DOD work and they were expanding based on university partnerships was a big thing. So they recruited me to help kind of build the business um, for them, for especially for university partnerships. So they were expanding, had several offices already and were opening a new one in Columbia, South Carolina. Um, so I kind of jumped on the chance because I had small children and it's getting to that age where they, if they went to school in Hawaii and made friends and we just wouldn't have let, ever left. We would have been stuck, put down roots because um, that was where I was born. Although raised. stuck in Hawaii is not like the, you know, the worst place probably. That's true. I mean, it's got its pluses and minuses, but I needed to get out. Of the I've been there my entire life and career, so I needed to leave. Um, so I jumped on the chance to open an office here in Columbia for that company. So that was in February 2020. I bought sight unseen right, right out of town here, um, right before the pandemic. Um, literally kicked it off in Columbia. Didn't even really meet my neighbors. Um, and then the best part of all, about seven months later, that the CEO and majority owner of that company got arrested for federal fraud. So he got indicted for PPP loan fraud about seven months after I moved here during the pandemic when everything was raging in 2020. So um, definitely one of those crisis moments where you just kind of hold your butt with both hands and, you know, wonder what's what's going to mm -hmm. happen next, right? This is also two weeks after my wife told me that she's pregnant with her third child. <laughs> so <laughs> crisis moment, right? You're, you're sitting there scratching your head. Yeah. Columbia is not known as a defense technology or Navy research hub by any stretch, right? So I was looking around at what do I do? Do I move again, you know, during the pandemic with a pregnant wife and two small kids? Um, what do I do? So me and myself and one other scientist at the company were do thinking the same thing, um, kind of always wanted to start a business. And it was one of those moments where I felt like it was kind of God's God calling the bluff, saying, mm. all right, you wanted to start a business. You've built up this relationship of partner networks, of customers. You know how this business works. Here's your chance. Um, do you really want it or not? And, and I even had a partner who is one of the senior scientists and engineers at the company who could do a lot of the technical work himself as well. So he and I took the leap and said, let's go for it middle of a pandemic, why not? And uh, and started, started Integer Technologies here in Columbia in January of 2021. Quit on a Friday, started on a Monday. Wow. So 
you know, you hear a lot of stories and there's tons of business podcasts out there that are that are doing what you and I are doing right now. And, and a lot of times you, you hear that person who's in your chair, they talk about the leap. You know, they talk about that, that crossroads of, okay, am I gonna do this thing I've been thinking about? But it's also like not pristine conditions, you know, but the red carpet just isn't rolled yeah, out. Yes. Can, can you talk a little bit more about, like take us into the leap as much as you can? I mean, <sighs> did, did you have a ton of savings to rely on? Did you, did you have business ideas? I mean, what, what literally did you bring with you out of your job, so to speak, and then take into the new venture? The skills, definitely. So, okay. so my advice, when people ask me, you know, how do I get started? My opinion, work. you gotta work five years at least in a company that's doing what you wanna do and understand how the machine works. Mm -hmm. I'm an engineer, so I think in systems, every business is a system, just how does it get food? How does it find food? How does it process? How does it do what it does? Mm -hmm. And if you are in, you, you work your way up, obviously you gotta work hard and be smart, right? But work your way up into a company for five years, learn how it works, you can you can do that yourself, mm -hmm. um, and so again I had a, had a partner who really on the science and technology side really understands what what the Navy cares about what they need. Um, myself on the business side really understood understood how that business was growing and what made it tick. Mm -hmm. um, realized it's not it's not rocket science, um, frankly, <laughs> um, <laughs> literally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, haven't haven't done any rocket work yet. Um, <laughs> more on that later. But that's um, I think that actually taking the leap back to your question about do we have savings, all that stuff. We went into debt. We <laughs> had a home equity line on a on a place we kept in Hawaii. Used that up. Um, didn't take a salary for a full year, like about a year. Um, just working our butts off every day. Didn't. Kept expenses very low, trying to get things moving. Um, but what encouraged me was my sister, who's who is an entrepreneur, so I have you know someone who can guide me and tell me what's you know <clears throat> give me good guidance on on this path. And she basically said, "Look, you've built this network up. You know how to do this. You're in a senior position in your current company. There's no better time to try this." And that was just a little bit of advice that I needed to make the leap and and have the guts to, you know, encourage my wife to go along for the ride there. And so she deserves most of the credit there and believing in me enough to, to have me not take a salary and take the leap. Yeah, you're not the first guest on the, on this show that's talked about just that kind of support network that that encouraged or or um, pushed in some cases, but or and believed in, um, because that that's really important. I think there's, a lot of talk out there about sort of the individualistic side of entrepreneurialism, um, and, and that you know is a, it is a thing, but but very rarely are people doing it completely by themselves. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure anyone ever has. Right, everyone's got some kind of whether it's knowledge, capital, you know, support, some in some way in that early stage, because no one's going to believe if you've never done it before. Right, if you're a first time founder, you have no track record. Right. right? No one's gonna, someone has to take the leap of faith in you, right? Mm -hmm. Because you've never, mm -hmm. you've got no experience running a company. Sure, you've been in senior positions, but you've never done it before. So until you've actually like, somebody's got to believe in your story based on what they see in you, as opposed to anything else. They can't look at your track record or CV to say, you know, it's gonna be a success for sure. So let's let's talk about the work that you guys are doing. So you founded the company, you got it off the ground. Um, it's only been, I guess, what two and a half years, really, since yeah, a little over two since that moment. Yeah. Um, so we're, you know, you're two years in. What what are the types of, of problems that that you guys are looking at? Well, I mean, at a big picture level, the way we see integer, um, it's it's kind of a gap between two institutions in our country, right? the Department of Defense and other national security cup customers, they need innovation, right? Everyone's seen the uh, news about the balloon, right? <laughs> Shot down off the coast right here, right? right. 
Um, it's a big deal. It's just one event, but it's it's a bellwether of, of geopolitical tensions that have been rising for the last 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, they need to stay ahead technolo technologically or we're gonna lose in a very major conflict, right? Just to put it bluntly. Um, so it, it's a true matter of life and death. I mean, yeah, people talk about I mean, national security seems like it's over, it's out there, but no. it, it really is. This us. is this is a very patriotic state too. We've got a lot of veterans here. Those are people who are in harm's way. They will die if they don't have the best tools at their disposal. So that's that's the very personal side of of what we do. And we have a lot of veterans who we've hired from Marine Corps, Army, Navy. Um, so it's real. So there's national security, they need technology, they need innovation. Then you have academia. These are the people who think big thoughts for a, per, that's for a living. This is what they do. And teaching the next generation of scientists and engineers to also think big thoughts and training them on the fundamentals of science and engineering that are necessary for technology. Those two types of institutions do not typically work well together. Um, in our country, we have what's called a university affiliated research centers. Those are meant to be for one specific university. They sit alongside the university and do applied research that can be classified and that can go towards specific DOD problem sets. But that's for one university. And there's there's less than 20 in the country. I think the Navy has 15. Um, and there's, there's not... A, anyone to bridge the gap between the big ideas that professors work on and, and new technologies that are often divergent in specific applications of those technologies to a capability. You know, a warfighter wants to do X, Y, and Z because they've done a war game and realized that they're gonna lose if they don't have this particular capability. Mm -hmm. So those are two, two sets that Integer likes to think we have kind of a foot in both worlds partner is a PhD in naval architecture, is a researcher. I've always been developing prototypes, you know, that actually have made it on, on the, worked with folks making making software that made it onto submarines. Um, so taking that arc of like, what's in the lab, what's a concept over here, more fundamental or basic research, pulling those prototypes forward to, until you can actually show something to a warfighter or a sponsor who actually want, would end up wanting to buy that thing uh, and put it in the fleet. You mentioned the word divergent. You said that some of the uh, university research tends to be divergent. When you use that word, what does that mean? That means they, um, there's also the concept of technology push and pull. Mm -hmm. So technology push, the way I see it, folks who are thinking about a new technology and all the possibilities of what that could do. Um, just let's just take a simple, it's a buzzword these days, but machine learning or artificial intelligence, like what could that do for, for us? What are all the possibilities? N totally devoid of a real world application yet. Just here's the thing, what can it do? Right, like right. it could start out writing your college term paper, but there's probably a lot more that yeah, you could do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. And so an example of like machine learning, artificial intelligence, has allowed us to do something called a digital twin. People use that, that's another buzzword, but the way we use it, um, I'll, give, I'll give a little analogy, but there are very specific applications of that digital twin that folks at the University of South Carolina are working on for a Navy application, right? They, I mean, they wanna put lasers on ships to be able to shoot down hypersonic missiles. Um, they have electric propulsion. There's all these things that they wanna do um, and a digital twin can actually help them do those things better. Um, but being able to take something again from the lab, very divergent, and pull it forward. Yeah, and so the digital is, twin is, is, it's not a physical mock-up. In other words, it's sort of a simulation of what the physical thing would do. But it sounds like getting it so that the digital twin actually works the right way through programming or using AI, that, that's really where the, the work is, I guess. Is that what, is that? Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll give a, an analogy that might be helpful. So if you imagine like a digital twin of yourself, right? Okay. So you could, John's sitting over here. Um, cool thing about that guy is he's just in cyberspace, right? He's 
and you can also fast forward him, you know? So you've maybe you've seen, it's old now, but the movie Supersize Me, right? Sure. Yeah. If you go and eat McDonald's every day for the next 20 years, what does that do to your health, right? Pretty easy to simulate that, yeah. right? Or, or even a more uh, personal example, you say you're not married, right? So you go and meet someone, could you fast forward to see what, what your life would be like with that person, uh, okay. right? Um, and all the simulations, right? Based on data from guys like John, you know, the, yes. the partner that you're looking at right there and forward simulating that and all the different possibilities, is that a good decision today to end up with that person? Mm -hmm. Or maybe not, you know, two years based on data, it's probably gonna end in divorce. Just as an example, right? Right, right. So that same concept applied. It's a lot easier with engineered systems, right? Like a, sh a ship, <laughs> right? Because we have both what we call physics-based models, which are like the fundamentals of how electrons move on a ship and all that stuff. We can have a model that does that. We can also have a data-driven model, which is machine learning driven approach where you've got sensor data coming in that in real time can tune your your physics-based model to be more accurate. Mm. <clears throat> so that can be running in real time alongside the physical thing, and you can run what-if scenarios into the future of different decisions you might be able to make on that on that ship. <clears throat> Hypersonic missile coming in. How many shots of my directed energy weapon, my laser weapon, do I have? Is that gonna fry my battery pack? Is that going to gotcha. not allow me to have electric propulsion right now? How do I move electrons around the ship to, to do that well? Uh, doing that in real time in a simple way so that a ship commander can make a decision, you know, is is one of the goals of that particular project that we're doing with USC. It's it, it's interesting, and I know that there are some limits on, on the, you know, how you can describe what you're doing, but going back to that push-pull in technology and kind of where <laughs> your company sits between uh, these research institutions that are sort of, like you said, paid to think big thoughts and just to explore and, and to research and even come up with maybe divergent um, ways of, of using something. And then you've got the Department of Defense that's trying to keep us safe and, you know, do all those things. Um, where do you guys, what's, how do you br make that bridge? Are you the bridge? Do you, do you, um, do you work more on push things or pull things or how does all that work in terms of you turning that into a business? Good question. Um, I mean, it's about funding, right? We have to have money for both us and our university partners to have the smart people to actually work on these problems. Mm -hmm. um, so one of my specialties is helping to get the funding. Um, okay. So the universities and Integer often team up and go after larger um, applied research and development programs that allow you know, in some cases, it's a it's a 50-50 deal where, where part of the program is more fundamental or basic research, where the university is drilling down into the pixel level of a computer vision um, system, for example. And, and we are taking maybe some algorithms or some basic concepts and turning those into a robust software that we can actually put on a ship. You know, that's, that's an example of, you know, talk about the technical maturity spectrum or timeline, there's the really fundamental stuff, right? Like quarks and bosons, you know, researching basic physics is way on the left end, right? And then like engineering a slightly better electric generator, right? That's way sure. on the mature end. So finding those, those things at the basic level or applied research, which is one step up level um, that actually have promise and setting up a program around it's based on a Navy need or a DOD need. There's a gap here. For example, autonomous ships don't navigate very well in the near shore waters. They can't pick up small things like a crab pot. You know, they're, the commercial automotive industry, Tesla and others doing a lot in computer vision. Those systems fail miserably if you put them in the water. It's just a very noisy, dynamic environment. Um, there's not huge databases of stuff you find floating in the water. So we're building databases of, of those things alongside our university partners who are looking at very specific algorithms to, to do that better. Um, so first of all, we help get the funding. We work together hand in hand, you know, partners on the bench, applied research partners with them 
And then again, our job at the end of one of these multi-year programs is to have a thing to show that we can demonstrate in the real world, whether it's on an amphibious vehicle or a ship or um, aircraft or an operations center. That's our that's our goal. We're not doing research just for research's sake. We wouldn't we would be a university if we did that, right? Right. But right. which we're not. So something else you mentioned earlier when you were talking about how you know how you sort of find work um, and, and find things to work on. You know, you located you, you your the company you started out working for located relocated you here to Columbia. Um, of course, we have the University of South Carolina here. Um, talk can you talk to us a little more about how you work with say this university here in, in town? and why being sort of co-located is, is a benefit, even though, like you said, this is not known as a hub of, of Navy research, but that's really not what you need, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I did say that because it's not generally widely known as a hub right. of Navy research, but believe it or not, there are folks at USC who have been doing Navy research for the last 25 years mm -hmm. in, in a very specific field and kind of top of their field as well. Um, Dr. Roger Dougal is one of them. Um, there's There's a half a dozen others who have been doing work in this field as well. So USC has a lot of intellectual capital there, a lot of really bright people who are respected in our, our industry. So that's a, you know, part of the reason I felt okay starting integer here in Columbia is having USC as a partner, right? So there's, and it's not just USC now that we're partnered with, we're partnered with Benedict College. So we've got a new Navy research program that's very early stage right now, but we're working with Benedict. Um, and and other HBCUs as well. So this is a this is a new thing. But so the benefit that the Navy sees in this, of course, like I said, getting a piece of technology across the they call it the Valley of Death, right? That 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 area between early stage research and a real thing or product, right? Carrying it across carefully and and delivering that. That's technology. But there's another piece that the Navy actually cares about arguably as much is the workforce. So the, the, the talent, mm -hmm. there's a huge need for US citizen, science and technology and engineering and math professionals working on national security problems. We don't have enough of those. And so they're recognizing that partnering with universities, so as even as undergrads, but especially grad students working on Navy problem sets or DOD problem sets early in their academic career leads to them being interested in it and wanting to go into that career. And if they don't, they're gonna go in, we were talking earlier, they'll probably end up in finance on Wall Street or something like that, where they can make a bunch of money um, because they're good at math. <laughs> so um, the, the Navy really appreciates the kind of university industry partnership where we're feeding, integer is responsible for identifying defense needs that might be a fit for the capabilities of the university Along, alongside the university, and then putting those programs in place so that even undergrads um, can get involved and say, these are really cool problems. Like the, the cutting edge of autonomous ship technology in Columbia, South Carolina, and I can get involved as an undergrad in electrical engineering, fantastic, right? Um, so, and the Navy sees that we're doing a STEM workforce study for the Navy, how do, what, what are the factors that lead to them staying in the workforce um, and being an engineer or a scientist who ends up working on, on Navy problem sets? So that's half the, the value that DOD sees as well. You know, talking about, you know, kind of exposing people to that work. And like you said, I mean, you've talked to me about things that I've lived here for, you know, almost 25 years. And I was, while I'm aware that there's a university, uh, down the street from us, you know, I'm totally unaware about this sort of niche level of research. And that's probably one of, frankly, hundreds of those that, that live, if you will, in our city. But knowing what you know about what it's like to interact with those people, to build, frankly, a livelihood around those interactions and bringing their research more to life. And But then you think about, okay, this is, this. The people live here, there's school systems and, and children are getting educated and hopefully going on to college. How do you bridge that gap of even letting young, younger students that aren't at the college level yet, like how do you help them understand what's going on right in their backyard and maybe get them interested in something other than 
well, let me go find the job that makes me the most money. You know, maybe it's something where if I'm more interested in something, I actually probably will still be financially successful. I mean, what? Just talking to John on footnotes. <laughs> <laughs> Get, getting the word out about how cool this stuff is. I yeah. mean, it. What I've seen, even at the high school level, kids get exposed to this to say, my gosh, like, you're sending robots underwater for days at a time, and mm -hmm. they're collecting sonar data and doing really cool things. Um, personally, as someone always interested in that stuff, it's like a no-brainer no that anybody who has even a slight tendency towards interest in science technology loves that stuff. And it's real world applications. It's not just theory. It's not just math and differential equations. Right. It's applied to real things that are happening today. And there's never been a greater need for it in our generation, right? Mm -hmm. Even 9-11, those are terrorist actors, right? Now we're talking about pure nation rivalry that's not going away anytime soon. Yeah. So despite what the, the budget goes, does we need to get more with less and it's it's a huge need so not only is there going to be funding forever right our nation's going to defend itself no matter what mm -hmm. but it's really cool stuff it's on the cutting edge um dod problem sets are not the same as tesla problem sets or commercial industry or google problem sets um and in my opinion they're more meaningful right because again it's life or death protecting our nation and our values in this country, so um, they just need to be exposed. They need to be aware. That's the biggest thing I've noticed. They just have no idea. You said you didn't even know the research group at USC is doing this stuff. You're not alone. <laughs> Most people don't. Yeah. So I think it's awareness. It's marketing, right? It's it's talking to people, um, getting your name out there. Internships are a really good way, right? We've we've got internships with HBCUs in the state. Um, just getting folks folks involved. Yeah. Once yeah. they see it, they get excited. Yeah, I've heard, again, you know, we've, I think, I don't know, you might be, we're getting close to our 50th episode, but I think this is 48 that we're shooting right now. And, you know, if anyone cares, they can go back and look at the, or listen to previous episodes. And um, we've even had people that have been involved in education. We've certainly had people that have been involved in business. And and it's almost like we, we've just decided that the two shall never meet. You know, they, they meet when you're finished with a, a certain level of education, but but we're not going to have these collisions along the way. We're just not going to do it, you know, is essentially. And and whether it's, you know, hey, these school children have to sit in a classroom, sit in a classroom literally from seven to three, we're never going to get that exposure when we educate people. And this is not to editorialize. Um, you can kind of pull my string in, in my back and I'll, I'll talk for hours about this. But... <laughs> It's sort of like, you know, just listening to you and you've built a business off, off of this. You had exposure at a young age through through your parents, you know, your background. We all have our story of kind of how we got to, to where we are. But what I also hear in your story is that there's plenty of work to be done and there's just not enough workers out there to do that. And, you know, are, is that really what we're going to is that really how it's all going to go down? Is we're just going to, you know, create this big self-limitation? Uh, that's a kind of a rhetorical question, but is that really how it's going to go down? Is these needs are not going to stop manifesting themselves? But are we going to? I think, like you sort of said, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you have kind of to answer that call. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I hope that's not how it goes down. I hope that, again, I think it's just especially the DOD is, I'll, I'll, I'll say it, the worst at this, right? Showing, it's it's not just big, greasy defense contractors with billion dollar contracts, right? It's, right. we're doing, first of all, really cool, interesting stuff in the defense of our democracy and our values. And by the way, a lot of it's like, if you like outdoors, if you like, testing and evaluation, if you like building real things, it's it's there. Um, and there's just not enough innovation that's going on in the DOD, partly because of the way the DOD is set up. It's very hard to work with, a lot of barriers to entry, but they're also not doing a good job of creating awareness of all the cool opportunities. I mean, having a six-figure salary after several years of work in, in an industry, that's pretty good in most yeah. places, right? And and that is available to most folks in the DOD 
industry, if you're in computer science, electrical engineering, mechanical, you, there's jobs for you. There's no doubt. And again, they're not going away. A lot of boomers are retiring. So there's all these empty seats available. Um, so I was in an all day meeting with the Navy last month on the workforce. They're literally, how do we spend our money better so that we can attract people from the, even the K through 12 level, the undergrad level, and get them to be aware and interested in what we're doing here. And so they're at the highest leadership levels. They're thinking deeply about this and they've got plenty of money to do it. So we're trying to come up with ways of how do we rethink the marketing problem and for lack of a better term, right? Like, and, and the, the just perception of, of what it's like to work in the defense industry and, and work well, on innovation. At the risk of not making this a three hour episode, which I would like to do actually, um, I really do appreciate what you're doing here and, and what, you know, you just, you make it a conscious effort to set your business up here to, to make a conscious effort to partner with a local university and also to, to, you know, gather a lot of people here locally to come and work it. I think your, your head counts now at about 20, 20. Yeah. Um, so this is probably the, you know, definitely a 20 person company that no one's heard of, uh, here in Columbia. We're, we're literally in a conference room on main street, but, uh, Duke, thanks for, thanks for, uh, taking that leap. Um, Kind of glad that guy got arrested. <laughs> so. Well, funny, funny story. Well, to get on a soap, soapbox for one minute, integer is is the root word of integrity, and that was just seeing there were thousands of lives affected by this one, yeah, one guy's really, really poor decisions, right? And so that was that was a big deal for me. And then I do have to think, I mean, the University of South Carolina for believing in us to, to enough to say, hey, Duke and Josh, my partner, we like you, we wanna work with you. That's that's really what got our start. So we have to thank, you know, the Dean at the College of Engineering, um, Jose Nashariri and, and the group there, um, Paul Zio, Mike Matthews and, and the rest of the team at, at that college. We wouldn't be here without that. And they just recognized that we had the drive. We wanted to make this a real thing and we care about the people too, right? We've hired, we're a third Gamecock right now, right? Yeah. We've got a whole bunch of USC grads. We've got Benedict grads, um, South Carolina State grads working for us now. So, and it's a wonderful thing. They start on the academic side. They're already trained by the time they graduate. They already know our project better than I do, right? <laughs> once they once they're hired. So, um, it's been it's been a pleasure. I mean, coming to Columbia that was part of the reason I actually decided to go come. People always say, "What the heck are you doing in Columbia?" versus Hawaii, Hawaii sounds magical. I mean, the the community here has been extremely welcoming, in my opinion. Like I wouldn't have come if it weren't for, especially the folks at USC, mm -hmm. who I was working for before I moved. Um, I worked with 20 universities across the country, a bunch of different DOD folks. This was, uh, they were the most entrepreneurial and um, excited about what we were trying to do out of all the universities I'd worked with, so. That's cool. So if someone is listening to this and they're interested in what you're doing and they want to learn more either for a job or internship, where can where can they find you? Integer-tech.com. Um, we're on LinkedIn. We're recruiting actively. We're still, I think there's still a software developer posting. There's going to be about 10 more this year. So we're, we're growing fast and we're going to continue growing. Um, new offices in Mississippi and Louisiana. Um, so please, Keep in touch with us, connect on LinkedIn. Yeah, we're there. That's great. Well, thank you so much for sitting down and for uh, telling the story. Awesome, thank you for the time, John, appreciate it.